So welcome to session five of this wonderful conference and thank you very much, um, Vanna, for inviting us all and your whole team for the wonderful hospitality that we experience here. So we are now focusing on legal cultures and the culture of law and so we have a, a team of more legally focused um, speakers but I have a suspicion we're going to talk far less about law than it appears to be. Let's see. Uh, anyway, we are seeing already that all these things are interconnected. And so now, if religion becomes law, if the social is legal, um, and if the lens of legal pluralism allows us to experience less problems um, than are faced by state-centric lawyers, okay, it might make sense to talk about uh, the uh, legal cultures and the culture of law. Um, we have three very different papers by three very different people and very busy people. Um, our first speaker is Prakash Shah, who is a reader at Queen Mary University in London. Um, Prakash did his PhD with me many years ago on asylum. Yeah. No? And uh, so we've worked together <coughs> on all kinds of things. Um, and he then took part in that Religare project <coughs> that many of you know took place here in Europe uh, over several years and finished in 2013 with a big report to the uh, European uh, authorities. And so your paper, I think we'll go straight to that because uh, we should not spend time on extra things, um, really asks a straightforward question. Does Durkheim enhance our understanding of law? and religion. And reading it, I, I was a little worried about this torchbearer thing, you know. So what if we start bearing several torches and uh, we get uh, <laughs> into some difficulty? <laughs> Let's see. All right, over to you. So, thank, um, yes, thanks a lot for a nice introduction, uh, Werner. And uh, of course, uh, may I repeat my uh, thanks to your hosts, uh, uh, Werner Gephardt, and your entire team who've been absolutely wonderful in the run-up to this, this workshop. And uh, in case I don't get a chance to see it, stay later because uh, I'm going to leave for the for the airport before the workshop finishes. Um, so uh, yeah, b burning many torches, I think, Werner, is very relevant because the same could be said of the paper that I'm going to present, you know, sort of uh, going into uncharted territory, which is sort of relatively uncharted for myself as well, but I think uh, uh, I will have a go. Uh, and probably less of the law, as you lightly, rightly observed, than more of the religion, so let's see uh, how it turns out. Um, when trying to assess the contribution of a thinker like Durkheim, uh, one could suggest at least two not mutually exclusive ways in which to approach the matter. Uh, one way is to appreciate his work in the context of his time, the zeitgeist, uh, and specifically the larger problem situation to which he was addressing himself. In other words, what were the concerns and questions that were around at, uh, at his time, and how did he think it appropriate to respond to them? Uh, after all, in some general way, the contributions of scientists are likely to be influenced by the context of their time and place, and the concerns that were pre prevailing am uh, among those around them, uh, whether fellow scientists or in the society at large. Uh, as Hegel said, uh, no man can surpass his own time, for the spirit of his time is also his own spirit. Having said that, Durkheim makes some universal and scientific claims. Rawls, uh, Anne Rawls, tells us that Durkheim had throughout his career been a proponent of science. <clears throat> he believed that many social problems were exas exacerbated by unscientific solutions. It may be important to evaluate just how his claims stand up to scrutiny not merely in the light of the history of science, but when placed against scientific criteria and the developments in the field within which he was working. In the context of this paper, uh, that primarily means evaluating his claims about religion. His claims about law, while wide-ranging, are not a central concern, except insofar as his claims about religion have some bearing upon today's growing field of law and religion. Um, thus, I attempt to pursue both approaches, by placing Durkheim in his context, but also by viewing him as a scientist whose claims can be tested in independently of his immediate context. In moving from one to the other, we will, we will see how Durkheim's stature diminishes. Sorry. <laughs> uh, however, I also claim that his status should be even more diminished than it is, um, and that it is not yet so, given the constraints that are prevalent due to the very culture in which he found himself working. 
In other words, the very context in which he was working, and specifically his cultural context, continues to enforce constraints which have meant that Durkheim's scientific claims have had a longer shelf life than they should have had. In a sense, we could view that as our problem situation. To state this problem situation more clearly, we could ask how it, how it is that a culture, i.e. the Western culture, can exercise the kind of constraints on the validity of scientific claims, in this case about religion, to the extent that even invalid scientific claims lead to behavior among scholars that appears to make it seem as if those claims are valid and productive. How do we show both, number one, why it is unscientific to believe in Durkheim's claims, and secondly, uh, that it is necessary for scholars in the world at large to continue to believe in, the, in those claims, notwithstanding everything that's been said in the workshop already about, uh, uh, about Durkheim, uh, which has been largely critical of him, I might add. Um, and that was completely unexpected, actually, looking at the paper titles, I thought it would be the opposite, <laughs> sort of very laudatory and so on, but it's been quite critical. In making these arguments, I, say, I set Durkheim's theory of religion against the better theory of religion provided by a scholar called Balagangadhara. Uh, given that his name consists of multiple syllables, I will abbreviate it to Balu, as he's popularly known. Balagangadhara's theory has never been refuted, although it has been dismissed by some who have not understood its central claims or because they've not read them properly. Uh, his main claims are uh, presented in, in a book uh, from 1994 called The Heathen in His Blindness, Asia, the West, and the Dynamic of Religion. As I suggest, one of the problems for us is why this better theory of religion has not managed to replace other theories which, despite their universal claims, depend on core Christian theological themes to make them intelligible and raise questions that are possible only within a cultural context like the Western culture, which is constituted by a religion, Christianity. One could raise the problem for many other pur purported theories of religion that have succeeded Durkheim, as recent work has been trying to grapple with. Uh, one scholar, uh, Timothy Fitzgerald from Aberdeen, for instance, says that there is no coherent, non-theological, the theoretical basis for the study of religion as a separate academic discipline. This kind of indictment, however, hardly filter, filters into legally focused studies on religion, which proceed in blissful ignorance of serious problems posed by accounts of religion elsewhere. One of the larger problems that Durkheim was concerned with is how solidarity can be maintained in societies. Uh, we all know this story roughly. Uh, th those with an advanced division of labor were based on organi organic solidarity, Gesellschaft, uh, as opposed to primitive societies that operated on the basis of mechanical sol solidarity, Gemeinschaft, with one church and moral system to which practically everybody subscribed. In the former advanced type of society, religion was less likely to be a unifying force than a divisive one. As Parkin, one of the Durkheim scholars, su summarizes the problem, a society with more than one church is a society asking for trouble, so much for legal pluralism. Um, Parking, Parking is somewhat uh, dismissive of the way in which Durkheim perceives the problem situation, seeing it as a self-created one, because of the way Durkheim defines society. But that is no more than uh, the con uh, contemporary critics saying that uh, because it looks as though multiculturalism cannot provide uh, cohesion in nation states segmented along religious lines, that it is not a serious issue that one should be concerned about. Clearly. Durkheim did perceive a problem in the kind of complex, complex Western society like France where he was working and about the very same, and that very same society continues to experience something of the kind of problem he was concerned about. Having said that, as far as I could tell, he does not discuss the idea of toleration as an output of Protestant Reformation, but only acknowledges toleration in its liberal secular form. There is also the scientific context to which he was uh, trying to address himself. As Rawls points out, Durkheim was simply, uh, not simply a social scientist, but was, was writing in awareness of the prevailing philosophical trends of his day, and he made a contribution to epistemology, so much so as to argue that the kind of philosophy that was taking place without reference to the social context was potentially in danger of becoming irrelevant. She explains, I, Rawls explains, that that could be a reason why he, he was just ignored by philosophers ever since. Durkheim suggested the solution to the epistemological dilemma of the time by arguing that individual rationality and consensus theory of truth uh, both placed emphasis on individual perceptions of natural reality um, as giving rise to valid knowledge of that reality. Instead, what was required was an approach embedded in embedded uh, so, uh, sorry uh, was an approach embedded in enacted social practice. Hence, a sociological approach to epistemology was necessary. Enacted social practices. Rituals were what gave rise to experiences and in turn the categories of rational thought. 
One can see here why Durkheim, for Durkheim, rituals and practices figure as prior to beliefs and ideas, and why the former explain beliefs and not vice versa. However, as Stedman Jones, uh, another uh, Durkheim, Durkheim scholar, emphasizes, shared beliefs are also important for so social solidarity. In an advanced plural society, then, shared practices were required, according to Durkheim, even more in order to maintain bonds and compensate for the thinning, thinning out of shared beliefs. As mentioned, Durkheim's contrast set for the advanced society was the primitive one, of which he advocated the scientific study in order to understand how moral feelings were produced, quote unquote, in the past. But note how this primitive society, which existed in the past, was actually a present day living culture of the Australian <laughs> Aborigines and to some extent Native Americans and others. The Australian present lies in the past when juxtaposed to the European culture. And that past would provide the answer to the problem of the European present. This kind of implicit evolutionism is present in Durkheim in a more explicit sense too, because of its overall assumption that there was some kind of evolutionary ladder from the primitive to advanced, uh, advanced societies based on moral order, division of labor, complexity, and so on. Durkheim therefore always has to wrestle uh, on the one hand with universal claims where humans and their societies are like one another, and at the same time acknowledge that, that there are differences attributable in his case to social evolutionism. Not only that, we should bear in mind Balagangadhara's observation, Balu's observation, that, quote, Orientalism and social sciences clarify each other's questions. The former constrains the latter to ask particular questions. These tell us about the kind of culture that asks these and no other questions. Key questions for Durkheim arise because of his primary concern with the state of Western culture, its individualism and the potential, potential slide to fragmentation, alienation and anomie. This constrains the kind of questions that can be asked of the data gained from the Australians and the other primitive societies, whose culture is not of interest in its own right, but apart from questions raised within the uh, social sciences, of which he became a protagonist. In fact, the situation is actually, problem situation is more <coughs> deeper than this, uh, for, for, for part particularly from our perspective, because the very questions that are being asked are also not just questions from the social <coughs> sciences, but questions that only Western culture can pose, as, as Balu indicates. So, um, this is not the one, is it? Uh, oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, uh, yeah I kind of skipped over this already. Yeah. So this is the relevant one. Huh? Uh, we'll look, have a look at Durkheim's idea of religion. Perk, ba Parkin says that for Durkheim, religion was the fount of almost every institution known to civilized society. Law, morality, contract, property, the arts, and even science grew from religious beginnings. If this is so, it provides ample reason for thinking that a religious attitude pervades Durkheim's own work, not only on religion, but in other fields upon which he worked, uh, we, and we, that would merit further scrutiny. I say that a religious attitude pervades his work, knowing that um, although Durkheim came from a long line of rabbis, he is known for his personal atheism uh, and for his method what uh, scholars have referred to as his methodological <laughs> atheism. I hope to be able to elucidate why I say that. Durkheim goes further than laying out a kind of methodological caution here. He manages to import theological presuppositions into his scientific theory of religion in ways that make his work far less useful than is generally regarded, either in his own time or even today. In some ways, we can see him trying to distance himself from explicit claims in Christian theology, for example, regarding the role of worship, which he, he takes to have a social function. Uh, rather than the affirmation of faith a believer has in God. In other ways, as I argue, he dons theological clothing in ways which are both obvious, as in his description of a community of believers as a church, and not so obvious. As concerns the latter non-obvious ways, these are where the influence of the deeper structure of, the, of Semitic religion, and Christianity in particular, enters most profusely enabling us to say that Durkheim is indeed a Western writer exhibit, exhibiting a Western culturality. His major work on religion, The Elementary Forms, is described as, uh, by Parkin as his most brilliant and unsettling work, um, by uh, Alan et al. as uh, Durkheim's most powerful book, his most demanding and exciting, um, as, by Rawls as the crowning achievement of Durkheim's sociology. It seems that lawyers 
on the other hand, have tended to ignore his work on religion. If one examines the multiple volumes that were produced by the Relicari project, admittedly I was part of that <laughs> as well, um, examining law and religion in the context of contemporary pl plurality in Europe, Durkheim is hardly mentioned. There are about seven or eight volumes that were produced from the project. Um, he's hardly mentioned. But this is not fatal to the claim that Dur Durkheim is still held up as an exemplary important scholar and theorist of religion. It's quite likely that lawyers lacking interdisciplinary competence may simply be ignorant of the social theory on religion and Durkheim's contribution to it. One of my lawyer colleagues from the Religare project said earlier on in its duration, quote, I know religion when I see it, unquote. <laughs> <laughs> That's lawyers for you, and I, I'm one of them. <laughs> When examining work from other fields, it's quite evident that Durkheim features prominently in university courses that relate to religion, and his legacy continues to be regarded as central, uh, especially in pioneering the sociological study of religion. Okay. Durkheim chose to focus mainly on Australian Aboriginal rituals as exemplary of primitive society's practice of religion. He felt that there were objective features that constitute what is internal and human in religion that have some meaning and function everywhere. Uh, that have the same function and meaning everywhere. However, he chose not to study a variety of religions in detail on at least two grounds. Firstly, that if a single case could not prove his thesis, uh, then a variety of cases would not do so either. And secondly, that ma the major world religions were too highly evolved to yield their secrets. They had become too encrusted with bureaucracy and immersed in theological argumentation that one may not see the religious wood for the institutional trees. Whereas totemism, was the religion pared down to its bare essentials. Totemism is a form of religion that generates the original distinction between the sacred and profane through its rituals, and totems sim symbolize and represent in externally internal beliefs. To demonstrate his belief that religion and the social were co coterminous, one of the moves he has to make was to avoid studying in any de detail what were thought as, uh, uh, what he thought were immensely complex societies that would not reveal what they had to. Here are Durkheim's own words, this is a rather long quote, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid, elaborating on his second ground, explaining why those essential and common elements could not be easily perceived everywhere. So he says, surely it is not by observing the complex religions that have arise, arisen in the course of history. Each of those religions is formed from such a variety of elements that it's very hard to distinguish what is secondary to them from what is primary, mm -hmm. and what is essential from what is accessory. Simply. Uh, consider religions like those of Egypt, India, or classical <coughs> antiquity. Each is a dense tangle of many cults that can vary according to localities, temples, generations, dynasties, invasions, and so on. Popular superstitions intermingle in them with the most sophisticated dogmas. Neither religious thinking nor religious practice is shared equally among the mass of the faithful. The beliefs as well as the rites are taken in different ways depending on men, milieu, and circumstances. Here it is priests, there monks, elsewhere the laity, here mystics, rationalists, theologians and prophets, and so on. This is still Durkheim. Under, the, under such conditions, it is difficult to perceive what might be common to all. It is indeed possible to find ways of studying some particular phenomenon fruitfully, such as prophetism, monasticism, or the mysteries, uh, through one or another of these systems uh, in which it is especially developed. But how can one find the common basis of religious life under the luxuriant vegetation that grows over it. How can one find the fundamental state's characteristic of the religious mentality in general through the clash of theologies, the variations in rituals, the multiplicity of groupings, and the diversity of individuals? End of quote. Durkheim's translator assures us, this is uh, Karen Fields, uh, uh, she assures us that Durkheim did not agree with his contemporaries and forebears that totem totem totemism was merely Christianity in embryo and had no interest in preser preserving a high evolutionary rank for any religion. Nevertheless, there is something here of the primitive essential core of religion that Christian missionaries and Orientalists spoke about when providing accounts of non-Western cultures with which they came across. In the Indian case, they applied their pre-formatted critiques of Catholicism by res resurrecting old Christian pole polemics of paganism and its corruption by a priesthood. The missionaries expected to find the proto-Christian or pre-Christian religion that the church fathers had, spoke, had spoken of as having been revealed to the whole of humankind and eventually leading to the quest to identify the doctrinal core of a religion, leaving behind the detritus accumulated over the ages. Durkheim's arboreal metaphor is more sanitized as he speaks only of luxuriant vegetation covering up the common religious basis of life. 
When talking of Buddhism, Jainism and Brahmanism in at least certain of its forms, Durkheim's uh, chief concern was to preserve their identity as religions, despite the absence of divinity or gods at, at the center. Come what may, luxuriant vegetation or the absence of gods, undoubtedly there was a religion to be found there. There is certainty of the universality of religion and that it is a, co a common basis of life which Durkheim presupposed and then took as his own task to explaining, in secular terms, of course. Durkheim perceived that humans frame experience in dualistic terms and held that the sacred profane dichotomy was the most basic universal duality out of which other dualisms sprang. In other words, all cultures share the sacred profane dualism, according to him. There is no crisp definition of the profane. According to Parkin, it refers to the mundane workaday world, the sphere in which people go about their uh, unremarkable routine business. Put differently, profane things are not the, uh, those not set apart and forbidden. It is not to be equated with the blasphemous or the sacrilegious of ordinary language, since these are part of the sacred. In fact, ritual pra uh, yeah. ritual practices uh, generate the division of and opposition between the two spheres of the sacred and the profane. Durkheim articulates his idea of the sacred as a response on the one hand to the animists and naturists who argued that sense perception leads to it and on the other hand to the innatists or innatists who presupposed that it was innate to humans. Durkheim argued instead that it is ritual that creates the first classification of sacred, sacred and profane and hence locates a social origin for the dichotomy. And in fact, I think he says that this is generative of all other dichotomies that, that, that kind of subsequently come about in society. Um, this is supported by his epistemological stand regarding the origin of the categories of rational thought in enacted social practices. So Durkheim says, a religion is a unified system of belief and, beliefs and practices relative to sacred things, that is to say, things set apart and forbidden, beliefs and practices which unite into one single moral community called a church, all those who adhere to them. Religion is always associated with a cohesive social group, which Durkheim, Durkheim term, terms a church, which is also a community of believers. For Durkheim, a church need have no formal bureaucratic structure or priestly apparatus. Mm -hmm. Cults and sects also have to qualify, or also qualify, so long as the members are a social collectivity. Magic, on the other hand, has no social base, no such social base or moral community. There is no church of magic, as as it were, as Parkin, Parkin says. So it is not religion. Durkheim emphasizes the social function of religion and says that religion is to be understood first and foremost uh, as first and foremost a system of ideas by means of which individuals imagine the society of which they are members and the obscure yet intimate relations which they have with it. Without religion and its symbolism, society would lack a proper consciousness of itself. Worship is the means by which a community celebrates its own identity through which the bonds of social life are invigorated and renewed. This meaning is to be preferred to the intimate relationship between uh, self and God, which a religion might speak about. Okay, so that's Durkheim. Uh, so we will turn to talk about Balu. Uh, so I referred earlier to the fact that there is a better theory of religion around today, which supersedes not just Durkheim's work, but all other theory making on religion. That account is provided by Balu's work. Well, Balu tells us that a secularized Christianity provides the dominant framework for the study of religion. Durkheim is part of that movement of the secularization of Christian theology in the form of the social sciences. In fact, one can say that Durkheim was a key figure along with others in achieving this secularization. This secularization has also moved, has moved to the background and is no longer easily visible, even though the presence of theology is pointed out from time to time by scholars. So I've mentioned Timothy Fitzgerald uh, uh, earlier on. Um, however, Fitz with Fitzgerald, he derives from this idea that religion as a category should be abandoned for analytical purposes, while Balu says that religion exists as a phenomenon in the world, but it is not, it is not universal to all cultures. Balu com comes to his own theory of religion after his critique of the secularized theological framework. As noted, he deals with religion as a phenomenon in the world, not merely as some discursively constructed idea that contemporary anthropologists like Talal Asad, Asad appear to believe in. Balagangadara proposes that religion is an explanatory intelligible account of both the cosmos and of itself. Its explanatory in intelligibility consists of bringing together two types of explanation, the causal and the intentional. The cause of the cos cosmos is the will of God. All that was, is, and will be is an expression of his will. 
We can know God's intentions by studying the cosmos and his revelation. According to Balu's theory, the Semitic religions, Judaism, Christianity and Islam, are religions. They are what religions are in the world. The theory explains the rivalry among these religions inter se and why they treated the heathen traditions as rivals on the same terms, i.e. on doctrinal terms. It also explains why the pagan Romans and Indians did not consider others as rivals. Durkheim, meanwhile, appears not to consider rivalry, nor does he, does he explain proselytism or conversion at all in elementary forms, unless I've not read him correctly. Balu also explains the necessity of faith, worship and truth within religions. These are not theory-neutral transcultural phenomena, as Durkheim appears to have held, uh, and as contemporary writing on religiosity, re religious studies generally, also tends to as assume. A religious person experiences the cosmos as both a causally explainable and an intelligible entity, so that he experiences his life as part of a bigger plan. To be religious means believing that human life and death have a meaning and purpose. Although religion was not invented to answer questions about the meaning and purpose of life, these questions are generated within the framework of religion. The explanatory intelligible account which religion is means having faith that one is part of the intentions of God. Faith and intolerance are two faces of the same coin because the one truth is so important to religion. Religious truth, being God-given, is independent of human knowledge. For human societies, it is God whose purpose is both the cosmos and the account that religion is embodied. God's message is addressed to humanity, postulating a relation between humanity and God, telling humankind what, what God's purpose is, and hence what the purpose of humanity is. Like erecting democratic structures, as we heard earlier on. If faith involves accepting the explanatory intelligibility of the cosmos and the account that says that that is so, worship affirms it and sustains faith. Worship is thus a specific idea within the Semitic religions, unlike the participation in a totemic ritual that Durkheim considers it to be. Durkheim's view of religion as society worshipping itself can be seen as a secularization and thus universalization of the Semitic notion. Um, I've referred to secularization several times, but what is it? Secularization has usually been described by treating, it, to, to, treating some variation of the Protestant account captured by Weber in terms of the disenchantment of the world as the explanance. In fact, we could see Durkheim's work as a response to such per perceived dis disenchantment and its associated threat to the moral order. In the hands of Weber, Durkheim and others, secularization amounts to the use of religious truths to describe a perceived phenomenon. Balaganga, Balu's theory suggests instead that secularization is a function of, fu function of the universalizing dy dynamic of religion itself. Religion spreads in one of two ways, firstly by secularizing itself and secondly through proselytization. In Balu's framework, the universalizing dynamic of religion demands secularization, which causes it to lose its specific reference to a religion since, since it is the truth. In order to spread further, religion has to lose its specific character, in our case, Christianity. Used in this sense, secularization does not mean the lessening or absence of religion, but the occlusion of the specific religion that Christianity <coughs> is, as part of its universalizing dynamic, and its spread in a non-religious guise. Therefore, when looking at the Lao Tse case, uh, I don't know if people are familiar with the Lao Tse case, you know, the, the case in which emerged from Italy challenging the... Uh, the hanging of a, of a crucifix on a classroom wall. It's, it's quite a famous, sort of well-discussed case in the sphere of religion and law studies. Uh, so when looking at the Lao Tse case, which uh, the European Court of Human Rights had occasion to rule on, among many others, uh, presents an excellent illustration of such a process. The ostensibly atheistic demand, so the parent who demanded the removal of the cross from the cl uh, classroom was actually said to be an atheist, like uh, avowedly atheist. Uh, so the ostensibly uh, atheistic demand for the removal of the crucifix is really the iconoclasm at the heart of Christianity, presented in secular form. Uh, and of course, one could go deeper into analyzing the case from this, from this perspective. In the West, the process has an old past. Since the breaking out of Christianity from its circums circumscribed monastic framework, uh, the Reformation and Enlightenment equally entailed other pro phases in the process of uh, secularization. Uh, more recent phases of secularization have been accompanied by the development of the human sciences, comparative religion, anthropology, sociology, psychology, uh, law, and so on. Each of these has taken some of the theological ideas of Christianity and represented them in secular terms, generalizing and universalizing them in the process. Um, and I mean, I, f I found Laura's 
the wonderful presentation yesterday very poignant because I think you're kind of reaffirming some of the claims that I'm making here in, more, more, in a more general sense, you're speaking about them more specifically in the context of law. Um, each of this, these has taken some theological ideas of Christianity and represented them in secular terms, generalizing and universalizing them in the process. Durkheim can be seen as part of this large cultural movement. Christian anthropology, in other words, the Christian theological framework about what, what the human being is, has thus become secularized and embedded within the human sciences. Critical ideas about human beings today, including the fact that they have human rights, that humans are intentional creatures, that they need to find meaning in their lives, that humans have religion, are all based on such a Christian anthropological framework. Through Balu's work, we learn that religion has been assumed to be a universal attribute of cultures because of the pre-theoretical intuition that was supplied by Christian theology. This intuition has informed all subsequent theory building on religion and is itself a part of the secularization of a key claim of Christian theology. The theological notion that all cultures have religion is one of the ideas that the human sciences have, in turn, incorporated. The, the, Durkheim does that as well. He thinks that the distinction between the sacred and pro profane uh, universally marks out what religion is. Uh, that unified system of belief and practices uh, relative to sacred things, as he says. The universality of religion has acquired the status of a fact assumed in the theories the social sciences produce. The universality of religion claim does not depend on empirical inquiries into religion, into cultures, rather it is the foundation of empirical and theoretical inquiries into religion. Thus, the claim about the universality of religion or that each culture has a religion which is native to it does not require proving because it is presupposed. It is pre-theoretical. It is widely accepted, at least within Western culture and among westernized intellectuals in non-Western cultures. This can be seen easily, for example, from anthropological reports, proclamations by states about religious diversity within their jurisdictions or by international actors like the Special Rapporteur on the Freedom of Religion and or Belief, who persists in his disagreement with me that ideas of religious freedom are theological and Western. A long or short list of such religions existing across the world may be given. Official discussion uh, tends often to remain at the level of world religions, but more refined accounts can be given a, or can be found in anthropological work. Variation among cultures is not assumed to create a problem for the claim about the universality of religion because that can be explained by there being different kinds of religion. However, the different kinds of religion thesis does not help to address this problem and the conundrum remains. The idea that all cultures have a religion native to them is retained even though the criteria which is said to make the Semitic religions into religions, i.e. the presence of creeds, belief in gods and, uh, God and prophets, uh, existence of scriptures and churches, have to be dropped in order to hold on to the claim that the non-Semitic religions are religions too. Durkheim resorts to such a move too when considering the status of Buddhism and as we've seen sort of certain forms of Brahmanism and Jainism as, as well. In order to preserve it as a religion, he has to dispense with the idea of God or divinity as essential to religion. Yet he accepts the centrality of Christ for Christianity <coughs> while universalizing the idea of the church. Durkheim's critical distinction between sacred and profane with all its seminal properties also involves the or universalization of a distinction that is made by and within a religion but such signals the further secularization in Balu's terms of key concepts within Christian and Semitic theology. How so? On the one hand, we can bear in mind Durkheim's own words when he refers to the division of the world in two domains, one containing all that is sacred, the other containing all that is profane. Such is the distinctive trait of religious thought. In response to Durkheim's dichotomy, and also to uh, Mercia Iliade, who uses the sacred and profane to indicate something different, Balu has this to say. If categories like sacred and profane are internal to a religion, or to homo religiosus, how can they help us to distinguish between religion and other phenomena? If the sacred and profane distinction is, to, is drawn within an init initiation ritual, then the initiation ritual cannot be seen as drawing the distinction between the sac uh, sacred space and profane space. Quite apart from this, how can this sacred and profane dichotomy help us to uh, distinguish one religion from another? The latter question can be easily answered in one way. Religions form a hierarchy, with some having extra dimensions, and we've heard that about Durkheim, whereas others have to make do with bare necessities. On the other hand, we could also say that Durkheim's, Durkheim attempts to reduce or flatten to a dyad what is originally a triad in Christian theology and in Semitic theologies more generally. 
and then to generalize it to all religions, as, as he thinks of them. So Durkheim takes issue with Max Müller, for instance, who made an arbitrary distinction between religions based on myths, uh, which he called a disease of the language and the mind, and Christianity, which Müller, uh, uh, which Müller uh, claimed was based on the truth. Mm -hmm. And of course, from a theological perspective, he's absolutely right. For Müller, it seems as though the theological triad of true religion, false religion, and the secular uh, still remain true, and something he had to work with. We can borrow from Durkheim the phrase that there are no religions that are false, as he says, uh, but taking a liberty with the sense that he wanted to give it by suggesting that he saw in all religions the realm of the sacred. But in doing so, he fails to explain what happens to the realm of false religion. One could say that Durkheim was instrumental in a further secularizing move by this reduction. Even here, there are two possibilities, since it is not altogether clear what Durkheim really thinks of the profane. As we saw, according to Parkin, rather like the secular, the profane is the mundane workaday world, the sphere in which people go about their unremarkable routine business. And it is not to be equated with the blasphemous or the sacrilegious of ordinary language since they are part of the sacred. In that case, the realm of the false religion may be hiding in the sacred. The other possibility, as Balu says, is that false religion may be something potentially religious, lurking in the realm of the secular, or as here, the profane. False religion doesn't disappear by making this move. It simply slips into the secular as an illegal alien. It continues to create problems for understanding how the secular state can deal, for instance, with the claim that teaching yoga in state schools uh, <coughs> violates the non-establishment clause in the United States. There was a case very recently about the teaching of yoga, which went to the <coughs> Court of Appeals in California, uh, which precisely had to answer this question. Is, uh, is yoga a secular or religious activity? If it's a religious activity, it breaches the First, uh, first Amendment. Uh, and you'll be happy to know, and all practitioners of yoga in, um, in the United States are obviously elated that they found that it was a secular activity. But the, the court cannot dispense with this idea of the, the, uh, the, the secular and the uh, religious. It's, it's in a way tied up to it, because it presupposes a form of Protestant theology. Mm -hmm. Part of the story of the spread of this dominant... Uh, so, sorry, actually, yeah, I've swapped my paragraph, so I'll say, as the West expanded it, it, its influence, religions were found and documented in different parts of the world. Uh, greater religious diversity was thereby created. A few centuries ago, four main religions were believed to exist, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, and the heathen religion. As travel exploration and missionary activity and colonialism broadened, unrelated phenomena were selectively brought together, creating specific religions out of the general category of heathenism. In India, for instance, uh, Hinduism, Buddhism, and Jain Jainism were identified. Elsewhere in Asia, uh, Taoism, Confucianism, and Shintoism were added to Buddhism. The very process by which this occurred is interesting because it paid attention to practices, not as traditions grounded in ancestral practice, so something like the old Roman stuff that Laura was telling us about yesterday, but as signifying beliefs requiring philosophical or doctrinal justification. In so doing, Westerners were reenacting an older criticism directed by Christians against pagans in the Roman Empire about how practices instantiated belief states requiring doctrinal justification. Since religion, and specifically showing that heathens had false religions, required the identification of beliefs which were assumed to be found in texts, texts were studied and beliefs found in them. Out of this activity, religions were created in Western universities. Ideas about these manufactured religions were then more widely dispersed and native populations in different parts of the world also began to talk as if they had religions as per the Western descriptions, suitably modified, of course. Since such constructions are uh, part of a more general Orientalism, uh, which can best we, we can be which can be understood as the expression and patterning of the Western experience of the Orient. These new heathen religions have a, have an ontological status only in the Western experience, but they cannot become part of the experience of people within non-Western cultures. Yet we have secular states like Japan, China, Indonesia, and India based on such absurdities, if I may say that. These questions do not appear to arise in, on Durkheim's horizon anywhere. Part of the story of the spread in, uh, of the dominant account of religion is to do with the historical contingency, as I said, of colonialism and Western dominance in the world. We can bra bracket away for now the fact that Christianity also spread through proselytization, as I mentioned, in Europe and other parts of the world, and continues to do so. In that context, the idea of freedom of religion in used by is used by evangelical forces and institutions like the US Commission on International Religious Freedom as entailing a right to proselytize. Other legal systems, uh, like the uh, several states in India, 
that have laws seeking uh, uh, that have laws seeking to control proselytization continue to resist such a formulation, but paradoxically also on the basis of the freedom of religion. Some of them are actually called freedom of religion acts, but they prohibit forms of proselytization, not all proselytization. Western domination has <coughs> ensured that its secularized version of knowledge about religion has become widely accepted even among non-Western intellectuals. The spread of the pre-theoretical idea of the universality of religion is only part of a wider acceptance of the Christian theological account of human beings in its secularized form. Although one may speak about wide acceptance in non-Western context, there remains a question of whether and how non-Westerners are able to access the experiences which, uh, which the concepts embedded in this account carry with them. This is part of the phenomenon of and problem Balu describes as colonial consciousness the inculcation of the account of the colonizer in the colonized through violence. Durkheim's work is irrelevant to addressing the experience of colonialism and knowledge in this sense. So I'll begin to conclude. Um, current discussion and legal decision making re uh, regarding religious diversity in the world takes place on terms, on the terms that the Western constructs have some ontological status. Theories in the human sciences assume their existence. Orientalism and the social sciences thus work hand in hand. The facts of one are presupposed by the other. As suggested earlier, one clarifies and constrains the questions. Uh, sorry, uh, yeah, as suggested earlier, one clarifies and constrains the question of the other, i.e., Orientalism and the social sciences. The formerly colonized or in other ways subject to Western dominance repeat the Western accounts. Although details about their characteristics are often discussed and disputed with the non-Western intellectuals, now making, more, uh, making them more elaborate and ad adding fashionable nuances, the basic structures remain in place. Although the newly furbished data may embellish the record of native religions, the terms of description are already established according to the experience of the West, not of the non-West. As Western countries further diversify through immigration and the establishment of non-Western populations, a similar dynamic is reproduced in these countries. The same questions about religious diversity and religious freedom come up within Western legal systems, but it is doubtful whether Durkheim's claims hold up to explain or solve the, problem that, the problems that these, uh, this gives rise to. So according to Balagangadhar's uh, scientific account of what religion is, and no better theory, as I said, has yet been made available, it looks, it looks as though uh, religious plurality consists of the three Semitic religions. Rather than speaking of religious diversity, therefore, it may be more advisable to speak of cultures that which have religion, Judaism, Christianity, or Islam. It means, conversely, that other cultures do not have religion, and that religion is not a universal, as Durkheim thought. The so-called religions, which have been constructed through the generalization of the Western account over the last few hundred years, should be dropped. I know it's a difficult thing to ask, but it should be dropped. <laughs> um, uh, since they are intelligible only to Westerners. This gives rise to a host of questions that Durkheim would ha uh, not have been able to raise nor solve because of the limits of his scientific and cultural horizons. To, the extent his work, uh, to that extent, his work must be held to be irrelevant to the problems of solving questions on religion and law. I would therefore answer the question raised in the title of the paper in the, in the negative. So here we are. <laughs> Th thanks a lot. Yeah.